The first thing to say perhaps is that Peter and I were colleagues in Oxford. We, we began our teaching careers in Oxford at the same time in 1963. That was when I became a fellow of St. John's and become, uh, began professional teaching. And Peter came to Hartford College as the reader in medieval German in that same year. Um, I don't think Peter found Oxford altogether comfortable to begin with. As we all know, it's a distinctly odd place. And Peter came from a normal place like London, where he had had already a substantial career. So I was very much a beginner, though he was an experienced academic. But at least I knew my way around Oxford because I'd been a student there and a graduate student there. We got on very well from early on. Later on, we were colleagues on the editorial board of Oxford German Studies, which began in 1965. Um, and um, uh, that has now reached its 50th centenary, 50th anniversary, sorry, uh, which we're going to celebrate with an upcoming number. Um, Peter did a lot of teaching for me because, of course, I needed a medievalist to do the medieval paper for my students. And uh, they all went to him for that part of the course. They all enjoyed it. And they all, <clears throat> as with everybody Peter ever thought, I'm aware, they, all got in, they all got invited to lunch. And they liked him greatly as a hospitable person and a very, a very relaxed tutor. Um, so they enjoyed going to him. And he, of course, always enjoyed teaching them. I mean, Peter was a natural teacher and he had a great deal of intuitive sympathy with young people. So much so that he, uh, his humanity is stated in a rather extreme form when he says, said once to me that nobody should examine who didn't have children, meaning that you had to have a sympathy for the poor victim of the examination before you started marking their papers. That's quite unfair, of course, to the many devoted people who put a lot of energy into examining fairly um, without necessarily having uh, offspring to remind them of their humanity. Anyway, that was typical Peter. Um, and um, something else that I only learned slowly about or gradually about Peter was that he had spent time in a concentration camp. And he actually referred to that as part of his education. And I think he meant that very seriously because it obviously provided insights of a kind that adjust your way of, of thinking about life. And I'll come to an instance um, uh, pretty well um, straight away. Um, Peter um, uh, looked in a way a very traditional person. Um, people in the earlier um, contributions referred to his his tweed suits and, and his his stance holding the lapels, and he looks a very, a very conservative old Englishman. But he wasn't an Englishman; he was a German in English disguise. Um, and um, there was a good deal that was not conservative about Peter. Somebody said, I forget who, that Peter was rather a radical, and I'm sure that's right. And on one particular occasion, um, he illustrated that with reference to his German background. Um, you may remember the case of somebody called Clive Ponting, a civil servant who leaked the details of what was really going on when we sank the Argentinian cruiser Belgrano. Uh, we claimed, it was claimed by the government, that it was em imperiling uh, the British forces. In fact, it turned out it was sailing away from the exclusion zone around the Falklands. And a man called Clive Ponting leaked this to the press and he was duly put on trial for um, uh, an offence against the Official Secrets Act. And on the day that um, the result of his trial uh, came round, we were dining in St Edmund Hall and the news came through that Ponting had been cleared by the jury, they had found him not guilty, where the judge had clearly directed them to find him guilty and Peter uh, proposed a toast to the English jury and ultimately I suppose to that aspect of the of the British system of justice and he referred and had in the back of his mind but made it explicit the contrast with the German courts in the Second World War the Volksgericht and the hideous person Roland Freisler whose name um, I heard for the first time on that occasion. But there was Peter toasting the jury, uh, which had given a popular but anti-establishment um, verdict on, on Ponting.
And Ponting, of course, left the civil service and had a, a, a quite distinct career somewhere else. So much for Peter and radicalism. Um, Peter certainly uh, had um, strongly left-wing sympathy. He was not a very actively political person to the best of my knowledge. The other thing I would like to go into a little bit further than happened with previous contributions is the matter of Burkhardt. I don't know when Peter's interest in Burkhardt began, but it was concentrated and brought into focus when he gave lectures on the Weltgeschichtliche Betrachtung and for the history faculty. There was always, I don't know if there still is, probably not these days, a German paper, a language paper with a set text for history prelim. And the Weltgeschichtliche Betrachtung were prescribed. The only snag was nobody in the history faculty wanted to lecture on them. So Peter lectured on them. Uh, I don't know whether he got it up uh, as it were specifically or whether he already very possibly he already had as a cultivated intellectual uh, a knowledge of the text anyway he did that and <clears throat> out of that arose and people who went to his lectures I know from a historian colleague um, were very impressed and when they had tutorials with Peter on the subject they enjoyed them like the people as the my students doing medieval literature with him did so Peter moved from that on to doing an edition, a freestanding single volume edition of the Weltgeschichte um, which ironically and rather ungraciously, uh, Hugh Trevor Roper gave a negative review of to the Times Literary Supplement. What was not good enough for Trevor Roper was clearly good enough for the Basel complete works of Burkhardt because they took over Peter's scholarly work in more or less unchanged form into that volume um, of, the, of the collected edition. So what is really interesting is that where we talk about the Einheit von Forschung und Lehre, the unity of research and teaching, we normally think of the research going into the teaching. And in this case, the teaching went into the research. Peter's interest as a, a lecturer stimulated him to go further with Burkhardt and it, reduced, uh, it, it produced this uh, impressive uh, piece of scholarship reduplicated in the complete uh, Burkhardt edition. That much I think seem, needs to be said about uh, Peter and uh, the other thing needs to be said about, about him and his, all his scholarly work is how modest he was modesty taken to the point of positively forbidding us to organize a festschrift. I don't know of any other academic who has ever declined the opportunity to be given a festschrift, but Peter declined it and he was very firm about it and he quite clearly meant it and so we had no festschrift for Peter. Um, I treasure his publications, he gave me his Tristan edition he gave me the freestanding uh, Burkhardt edition and he gave me the relevant volume um, of the collected works of Burkhardt and they have a primary place on my shelves. Many thanks. I, I think despite him declining a festschrift and also uh, David Gunn saying that he would have protested against a centenary celebration, um, the sons said after we had done it uh, that he would have enjoyed it after all and I'm, I'm sure he would have enjoyed your contribution. Many thanks. Okay, pleasure. <laughs>